Okay, let's start with the second lecture. Uh, the second lecture is, talk, uh, is called Deep BD Object Segmentation. Um, and I'd like to acknowledge uh, Carlos Banduria, Miriam Ballbe, Maya Salvador, and Andrew Girbao, with whom we've been working on this topic for during the last, um, I would say, year, I guess. So first, I'd like to uh, define the task that we are tackling here. Um, actually, there are going to be like two tasks. Um, here, the goal is given a, a video sequence. Okay, this represents like the first frame of video sequence. This represents the next frames. It's given a, a video sequence, and whether given a mask of the objects you want to track. So you have like these two skaters, and the skate down here very small. Okay, so given uh, this mask, uh, track them. Okay, uh, segment them in each frame. Uh, for each frame, or so that's what we're going to call semi-supervised or one-shot video object segmentation. So semi-supervised in the sense that we, we give, provide the mask for the first frame of the, the object you want to follow. Or there's, there's another task called unsupervised, or we call it zero-shot video object segmentation, in the sense of unsupervised that in the first, so that the, we don't provide any uh, mask to track, so that the, that the system should be able to generate the mask by itself. Okay, there's no reference provided. Okay, so most of the words I'm going to talk about, they they cover the first topic. It's just the, the last word I'm going to talk about that covers the the case where you have nothing at all. And we'll discuss about its limitation and how to improve it. So just that you understand better, it will be like the first task, the one shot video object segmentation. Now I'm going to show you the results we obtained here at UPC in a recent work. So we the mask are provided for the first frame, and the goal is to uh, track the mask for different objects. So notice that there are like different colors. So it's not a foreground and background segmentation. It's a bit more uh, complicated because we need to distinguish the different objects, okay, and track them, sep um, segment them separately across time. Um, okay, so this will be like the semi-supervised video object segmentation. On the other task, that will be the unsupervised video object segmentation, there are no masks provided, but still should still be possible to the detect the objects and segment them across time. Okay? So that would be kind of more or less the state of the art nowadays for, for this kind of task. Okay, let's see how we can solve this discuss. There, there are different ways to do it. So first, if you want to solve the task, you'll need uh, some data. And there, are, uh, th th there have been a few data set and benchmarks. I'm going to highlight a couple of them because they are the, the largest ones. Uh, this first one, it's, it's called Davis. So here I refer to Davis 2017 because that's the last one, but there was a previous one. Um, as you see, so there's a, there are nine, 90 training videos and 30 testing videos, and they are all uh, segmented. Uh, manually, so the, there's a uh, one or, or different objects, uh, video objects segmented, and the goal is to track. But just notice that not all the objects are are segmented. Okay, so the the, the task actually because it starts with with uh, the first frame annotated. Yeah, so that's the uh, the task we we want to solve. If you want to check the detail, just click on this on this image, and actually there's a there's a new edition of, so there's a challenge every year, and there's, the challenge is open now, so I think the submission is by the end of May, so if you feel curious about this task, you can try to solve it. Then uh, there's another uh, data set, and there was a, a, a challenge as well, last uh, autumn, just called the YouTube uh, Video Object Segmentation um, data set. And here, uh, well, the main difference with Davis is that, is that the data is much larger. So here, that's the YouTube video output segmentation. And you, and you can compare it with uh, Davis. That would be like 2016 and 90. There are other works, but you see that the, the size are, are smaller. So the YouTube video output segmentation is the largest one. So if you want to do something and you're not going to label uh, thousands of videos, you probably want to start here with this public data set. And you have around uh, more than 3,000 videos 
all different object categories, and you have the categories, uh, different objects and notations, and that, that's the total duration of the, of the notated data. Okay, um, so there are like different techniques that have been explored. I'm going to go through them. Uh, the idea is that I'm going to follow some words, but I think that you can probably, what I explain, uh, apply to other problems which not generally explicitly be, be the object segmentation. So the first one it's called uh, online learning, and what it does it's uh, this, this process this has the particularity that uh, it's applied frame by frame. So it's it's true that it's solving the be the object segmentation uh, task, but it's applied frame by frame. So here you have the whole pipeline of this work it was called Osbos. And the, basically, the idea is that you have um, you have some network that's pre-trained on on ImageNet, and you are doing like um, a network that it's trained on the training partition of the of the challenge, okay, to to kind of solve the task. But what what it's really in interesting from from this work, it's the last step, okay. This last step is what they called uh, online learning. And it is that just remember that in this task, for the one shot or a semi supervised task, what you have is uh, you have the mask for the first frame. Okay, so what they do is they have a network. They, as you said here in step two, well, step one and two, they first they train with ImageNet for misclassification. There's no segmentation. With the training partition of Davis, the network learns to segment the, the objects with the appropriate annotations. But in the, in the last step, what it does is given the mask of the first frame of the object you want to train, you are going to fine tune this network for this mask, okay? And then what you do is, what that network, it's a convolutional network, you apply it uh, frame by frame to the rest of the sequence. Do you understand what I mean? So I'm going, so the, the point is that, for example, in this, in this case, you have this uh, denser, break denser, this mask is provided, and you, you fine tune the network to solve the, this, this frame only. You, you only have one image and one mask, okay? You fine tune it, and in the end what you are telling the network then it's like what, what is foreground, what is background in this scene. And then if, if the sequence doesn't change much, the network can, can provide uh, quite decent results. You see like uh, even, even if each frame is processed separately. The, the, let's say you can think that the network is overfitted to to this to this mask, but that's actually what what you are trying to do. You want to track that object. So, one limitation of, of this work is that as uh, this is processed frame by frame separately, um, you might have like some inconsistencies. So these are like some results. Uh, where you have like this first annotation. In red, you have la the annotation on the first frame. And for example, over here, you see like this, that's that in green, you have the predictions. So the network is predicting that this uh, part of, of, the, of the wall, it's, it's, it's corresponds to this object, okay? And which probably could be solved if there was some temporal consistency. It w there was some temporal consistency, okay? But still, the results are, were, were pretty good. For this work, so you he here you have another one in which the like the car, uh, even it's, if it's very small in the first frame, uh, what it's learned for, from this first frame, it's, it's kind enough to, to distinguish the object from the background in, in these other frames. Yeah, that would be like one option. So you, if, if you have a mask, you, r you really fine tune your network to that mask and then you run it for the rest of the sequence. And if you do it like, Frame by frame, you will have problems in temporary problems. Okay, um, here in this example, what you what you what you see is like the result of the network. Um, so the the result of the network for this sequence, when trained during uh, ten seconds, that would be like this this case. Or after training for one minute, you obtain this mask. Yeah, then based on this observation, um, what do you think that, what limitations do you see in to online learning? 
Do you see any drawback or do you think it's perfect? Apart from the temporal consistency? If, if you are going to build a company that's going to run this, I mean, I'm, well you can do it, but what's, what, what do you think it's, could be a limitation for that? No limitation? Uh, yeah. Oh, okay. Not really. But yeah. Well, yeah, but actually what, I mean, I'm not sure if, if I explained well, but the point is that, so you, when you have like, so that's, that's, let's say that's the base, the basic, the base network, and then for each sequence, you fine tune, but then for the next sequence, you, you, for, you, you don't use this one, but you start here, and then you fine tune for another sequence. So that shouldn't be the problem. So what I, what I, when I was, so I'm just putting time here. Do you think? Do you think? Okay, probably without a clear application, not that clear. But the, the point is that f fine tuning for every sequence that you want to track the object. Okay, it's, it can be costly if you are going to do that at scale. Um, that's going to be computationally uh, expensive. Okay, that's, that's what I would like you to think about. That fine tuning. So I know that some of you tried to do it this week for the project. It requires some computation. Okay, and if you're going to process a uh, uh, large amount of data, like refine tuning for each sequence, that's, that's costly. Okay, it will be, it will be, of course, it will be great if you don't have to do that. If you had a network that generalizes very well so that it can really capture the whatever object you show it with a mask with no need to find things. So what would be great is that, is that this network that is trained with the training data set work pretty well instead of providing these, these results. Do you agree with that at least? You, I mean, you, you skip this part. You skip this, let's say, one minute per sequence. Yeah? Okay, then on the, on the other, another question. Um, so we, we always tell you that, that deep learning uh, neural networks, they require all this huge amount of data to, to train. But here I'm telling you that we, so that, that this, that they managed to train a new network with only one frame, right? Which is, all, let's say, only one frame. Um, do you think this makes sense? And so does, does, does it look contradictory to you when I'm telling you that normally you have like all this huge amount of labeled image to, for image classification, but here they are just training this network with a single frame, fine tuning. Or does it make sense or am I doing something wrong? in the reasoning which I am. Yeah. I think the issue is that the network is trained before on the data that just three articles and now we are with the ones that trained or the selecting the set of sequence that was trained before and we know just how each part of world looks because with the network was trained on completely different images like Okay, yeah, that's, that's part of the answer. Okay, that's a, that's a good point. Any other point? So, so in general, I, I'm not sure, so have you done image segmentation, I guess, in some lecture or so? So do, do you remember like the, probably you don't, <laughs> the size of the data sets for Im used for image segmentation? Does anybody remember any? No? Okay, so if you look, just, just trust me then, if you look at the amount of images the amount of images that are in the data sets for image segmentation, and you compare it with the amount of images which are in the data sets for image classification. Yeah, so for the images in, in the data sets for image classification, they are order of <coughs> millions, like ImageNet or million ImageNet, while in the ones for segmentation, just for example, uh, okay, YouTube, well, that's a bit more. Okay, for the, the ones for segmentation, they are much, much smaller maybe the order of thousands. But still, you solve a task segmentation, which looks, it looks more difficult than image classification, right? So where's the, where's the trick here? What, I'm, what am I missing in this reasoning? It shouldn't work, right, from what I'm saying? 
So image classification requires millions. Segmentation seems harder task, but there are less data in the data sets. And OK, I know that you can pre-train work for image classification. That's fine. But apart from this, you can actually, can actually train from scratch for the ones for segmentation. Excellent, yeah. That's the point. So you, you actually have a feedback for each pixel in the image. You are, you are, if you are that pixel, you are labeling correctly or not. But for image classification, like you have, let's say, one feedback, one loss for the whole image. Yeah, so always like, keep that into account. And of course, it's so much harder to annotate and, and uh, that decides for segmentation than for classification. But when you think about uh, sizes of data sets, keep that in, in mind, OK? Good, so let's uh, go for another, let's say, basic approach that has been um, used for, to solve video object segmentation, with, which shows that it helps, which is called mask propagation. And I think that with the name, you can probably tell me what, what it is. What do you think it is, mask propagation? That is something like good to do if you, if you are going to do video object segmentation. What does common sense tell you? So the problem is that given a sequence of video frames, you want to predict for each frame the mask of one object that is provided, that it's segmented in the first um, frame. So what do you think mass propagation referred to? Yeah, very good. It's going to be, it should be similar, right? In, in video, like in, in video sequences, frames just don't change randomly, right? They, normally they are very similar. And if you have a mask in one frame for one object, you expect that in the next frame, the object, so the mask should be kind of similar leash, right? So, so what this, one, one uh, basic uh, trick here is just to fit the prediction of the previous mask to the next frame. Okay, and that's a way to fit the temporal information into the into the architecture. Yeah, so that would be the idea. So you have your your sequence of of video frames. You have your CNN network that is going to generate your mask, and the mask you predict, you fit it somehow <coughs> at the next time step. Yeah, and then you predict the next one, and you fit it to the next one. In the case of one-shot object segmentation, you actually have, remember, you have the, f the mask for the first frame. And so you start it from there. That, that helps a lot. Yeah. So the first ones to try this is, was this work called mask track. But basically, they, they show that by uh, feeding the mask of the previous uh, time step help a lot in generating the next one. And actually, that's a way to introduce the temporal information, right? Which is, which is not what they were doing in the first word that I show you, the Osbos one. Yeah. More uh, flow, I call it flow pro propagation. What do you think it is, this, this, uh, this technique to improve the performance? What, what, same thing, what, what it means, <laughs> same thing. Okay, but it's not, but the flow, I'm not predicting the optical flow. Here, in the previous one I was fitting the mask and I fit in the next one. The optical flow, you can fit the optical flow and that helps you because it gives you like, so, it tells you some idea of how is the motion on, on the, on this scene. Yeah, and also, that's also a way to introduce the temporal information. And that's very related, if you remember from the first class, actually the, it, they will have like these two, tr two stream architectures that they combine the RGB channels with the optical flow. So that's kind of the same idea applied for video object segmentation. Okay, so that would be like the first work that, that used it in 2017. And that here you have like some exam one example of the optical flow computed. It it's computed with another totally different technique, but by feeding it into the network in a two-stream fashion, the results improve, okay? And I can tell you that for the next week, you can, you can do this in your project assignments. You can 
as you know, you know how to, how to compute, uh, you will know how to compute optical flow. We will ask you to explore how we can improve. Okay, uh, then there's another work that I like quite a lot that actually combines both things. It combines the optical flow and the mass propagation. Well, I, I was thinking about the next one, but okay, this one as well. Um, here what they do is they, um, they print the mask for, for the object, so they do mass propagation, and they use the optical flow just to, to warp, so to, to adapt, to predict. So you're already using the optical flow to predict what's the mask going to be in the next frame, okay? And then you still fit this warp mask into the network to predict the, the, the actual mask, okay? The architecture here is a bit more um, complex because they, they also do like some, uh, they do the, they use bounding boxes and then they refine, they, they so they predict the bounding box and then they, they extract the, the mask from the bounding boxes. I don't, I don't want to spend time in there, it's like, you know, like mas Mascar CNN, that I think that uh, Michal talk, talk about it, so that's a, a quite a classic technique. Then uh, this work is called uh, Mascar NN, if you see it, it's here on bottom left. Um, and maybe probably if, if you were in Adriana's lecture the other day, you can think about RNN with some specific architectures, right? Um, but actually, uh, wh what do you think in the architecture, if you look at it, there's no, there's no LSTM, no GRU, none of these networks that, that Adriana talked about. It refers to something else. So what, what do you think this, this RNN refer, refers to in this architecture? I mean, th th these are kind of easy questions, okay? So they, so they call it mask RNN, but there's no LSTM, there's no group. They call it mask RNN because there's this recurrence that, that that's what I called mass propagation earlier, that they, they generate the binary mask and then they do a recurrence relationship, they call it, so that the previous mask is used uh, to, to, you, to, to be combined with the optical flow and, pred and try to, to make a, a rough prediction for the next frame, okay? But then get confused with this work with MascarNN because there's no LSTM. Okay, that was the work that I had in mind earlier. Um, there's this other work called Lucid Tracker, and in the work they explored two architectures. Okay, the first one uh, we like uh, the two-stream architecture. They still like fit concatenated the image, the mask from the previous frame, and you want to predict the next frame. And in this two-stream architecture, they have another tower here that they fit the optical flow, they compute the optical flow, they fit the, the mass from the previous frame, and then they combine everything to predict the next mass. So they are using optical flow to improve it, okay? That's this architecture, and they have this architecture where instead of having like two towers, they put it all together. They concatenate RGB, optical flow, and the mass from the previous uh, frame to generate the next mask. So that's another way to do it. Um, then question for you. Um, if you remember in Davis data set or actually the, the, generic, uh, the generic problem or the generic task, you, don't, you shouldn't limit to one single object, right? You should be able to deal with as many objects as, as you wish. Um, how, could the, how could you adapt these architectures to be able to handle more than one object without changing much the architecture. With a single pass so that it, it, gen it could generate as many masks as objects to track. So maybe I guess the, the, the hint I can give you is like, okay, so in these examples they are, uh, they are predicting the mask for one object, okay, and they have one channel for the mask, and then if they wanted to predict the channels for two objects, what would, could you have? Yeah. Yeah, so that's... Yeah, excellent. So what you could do is you could concatenate, I mean, 
Um, that's what they do. They, in order to manage the case of multiple object tracking, they concatenate uh, different masks. Okay. Um, another question: Like, which of these two architectures do you think it's going to work better, the two stream or the one stream? How many of you think that the? Okay, now I'll give you ten seconds to think about. Okay, thumbs up. So how many of you think that the two stream is going to perform better? How many of you think that the one stream will perform better? Okay, excellent. Okay, is it a random choice or can, do you have a reason <laughs> for that? I think combining the two is better than analyzing them separately. Okay. Intuition. More reasons? Specific object, what you say a specific object, I'm not really sure if I understand what you think about. Um, no? Okay, don't. Oh, it can capture it here, yeah, because you, you train it. It, it. it could capture it here. So, I, I know it's farther, a bit farther away, but it, it could capture it. Okay, um, so I will give you Let's go for the next one. So these are the results. So uh, as you can see, um, when they made this comparison and they observed that the two stream one uh, performs better, okay. Um, one reason for it is that the two streams one there are more parameters because there are two streams, so it's like having two networks, okay. And if you if you have enough data, that might be the difference. It's sometimes you, you see papers that say, yeah, you have this model it works super well. But it's true that if, and you compare it with another model, but it's true that if they have a different amount of parameters, it's the comparison is not that fair, okay? I mean, you, you could do it, you could play with the amount of filters. Let's say, I guess you should use, I guess, the half of the convolutional filter in the two stream, I guess, uh, and then you will have the same amount of parameters. Yeah, it will be fair. Um, but, okay. Okay, so even if it works better, uh, if, if you are going to build your company or whatever, and you are going to use one or another, which one would you use? One stream, for any reason? Okay, so the yeah, the authors reach the same conclusion, actually. So they do the study, and in their paper, they use the one stream, and they kind of argue, say, okay, there's a, there's a lot of os loss of performance, but it's much lighter and easier to train, so they use this one. Good. Last one. Uh, so we are dealing with uh, video sequences, and you know that for sequences, there are these tools, the recurrent neural networks, that they are Okay, that's it's one way to deal with uh, temporal information in, in with neural networks. So in this case, what you would have is um, you could have a, a network that's going to predict the mask for each input frame, and you can think that the basic basic approach would be like um, you you rely on the the memory of the network of the recurrent neural network to remember what it predicted in the past. Okay, so I mean. Um, previously, we were, f we were doing the mass propagation, but you can think, and you can, it's just something you can think about, um, that the hidden state in the RNNs, it, it might be enough to remember what it, what it predicted in the, in the previous frame. Okay? That's a hypothesis. I'm not saying that it's true. Okay? It's a hypothesis. Okay, so what people have done, actually, that this, uh, yeah, that's a paper from the YouTube POS dataset. So, so the paper of this, very large data set, they also propose a model, and they propose this kind of model. They, they train a neural network in which they use a Combel STM. Have you ever heard this name before? Some, some have, okay. Comb, convolutions layers, yes, right? Uh, they are these local filters that you have seen in all these models. LSTM, at least you heard it the other day with Adriana, it means like it's kind of a 
network that has memory, has like four gates, blah, blah, blah. And there's, there's nothing prevents you to have convolutions that remember what they have seen in the past, okay? So you can have combat STMs, you can have com groups. There's no problem, okay? Well, you're going to have more parameters to learn, but th it's not that one layer must be convolutional or recurrent. You, when you are dealing with sequences, you, you could have both, okay? And that's what they use in this work. They use combat STM so that uh, in this case, they, uh, in this work, what they did actually is they train, so it's kind of an online learning, um, each, um, the network for each instance to be tracked, okay? And they, they run it on the one shot, the semi-supervised uh, task. There's another work which kind of follows, does something similar. In this case, they use the com GRU. GRU, remember, it's the other flavor of RNN that I didn't talk about, in which they, they uh, process the RGB, but also the optical flow. Yeah, so if what we would like to see, to understand and see is that kind of everybody's doing just, there are some ingredients, most of them, we saw them in the first lecture on deep learning video architectures, and now you have, okay, now you have this problem of video object segmentation. Now you kind of use the same ingredients and you apply them to your problem. But using optical flow, RNNs or not RNNs, they are kind of similar things. And they also like uh, have this problem, oh sorry, they, they solve the task. And then that's the work that we have the all about UBC that I'm going to spend a bit more time. So these are the results that you saw at the very beginning. That's the ones that we obtain in, in our model. In our model, uh, what we have, it's, it's totally based in RNN. So it's the first model that it's fully end-to-end -end trained and it can track multiple objects, okay? And the trick here, compared to the previous ones, is that we don't only have recurrence in, in time, but we also have recurrence in space. Okay, and now that's a weird thing, probably, and that's what I'm going to explain first. So we have, uh, this will be like the time axis, so we have a common STM that it actually uh, processes the sequence of frames, but also given one frame, the same common STM will generate the different objects that, uh, that are in that frame in a sequential manner. That's kind of a novelty thing. So this is based on a previous work, this one. So just imagine that you have like each frame time t, time t plus one, time t plus two. And when you feed the frame, you have a sequence of instance of objects that you take in the image, okay? For us, the, tri the whole trick of our paper is that we, we feed the first frame, we obtain the objects in a recurrent way, and then for the time step t plus one, as we have the hidden state, we keep the hidden state of the common STM, we, we feed it, so we, we copy it as an input at the next time step. But that's, that would be like the, the time step for the first instance. And for the second instance, we, we fit the hidden state that was used to predict the second instance. And that, th that's the way how the COML STM uh, manages to align, let's see, the detections that, that we generate. Yeah? So just going to show you the example uh, first in a previous work from, uh, I should update the reference, it's wrong, but I, I will. That's a, the that's a correct one, called RCs. What we have is, so we have an image, we feed the image in the convolutional neural network, we extract features, different layers, and we feed that into, into a recurrent neural network. So that the recurrent neural net network is going to generate a sequence of objects. So there's a bike over here, at the first time step. And then there's a dog at the second time step, okay? And, until, and actually the, the network learns when to stop. When, when the network thinks that there are no more objects, it's okay, that's, I'm done. There are no more objects. That's what we, what, we, what we use. So what we do is, for each frame, we extract the convolutional features. We feed it into an RNN. So the RNN, in this case, it, the first time step, it detects the person. This, this direction is space, okay? The second time step, it detects the horse. The third time step, it detects the, the jog, okay? And then for the next frame, we, uh, let's say we, we copy the hidden state or the RNN remembers the hidden state that, that he, he, where, where it was when he detected the, the previous person. So he's, he's already, let's say, biased towards, at this time step, predict also the person. And it, at the second time step, predict the, the, the updated horse. The next time step, predict the updated jog. Yeah? And we, for 
Well, that's it's, it's it's the same RNN. Oh, okay. So it's called. It's oh, it's, it's, there's only one. Okay. It's only one, but sometimes we 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 run it on time or on oh, sorry on space or on time. But it's a single one. So actually, that's that's the model. If you want, well, actually there are like different ones because there's an upsampling. Um, but that's how how it kind of works. But it's it's not that. I mean, it's, it's just. So I know that I, I know we know that we copy here RN RN RN, but it's one RN, okay? But on the other hand, <laughs> it's true that it's not one RN because we have like a different uh, special resolution. We have different common STMs, but it's that's, but that's because of the depth of the network, not not because of the spatial or temporal recurrency. Yeah, we use something called uh, skip connections. I hope you've seen somewhere that. Um, I think that's the basic stuff. Then uh, what we see with, with our model, it's this one on the, at the bottom, so that it uh, performs very well on this metric called F sin, F and sin. So what we do is we, there are two metrics in this challenge, the Jacquard index and the F score, and we discriminate between objects that were seen during training, the classes of objects that were seen during training, or objects whose classes were never seen during training, okay? So we are uh, especially good at, um, with the F score, Competitive with others, we don't use any online le online learning, okay? And here you have like the value of in terms of speed. So let's look at this speed value. So you see like our model is uh, kind of sorry. So this this is with a K80 and this with a P100 in seconds, okay? Uh, so the model is, is pretty fast and it's trained end to end. And then question for you. Oh, no, I don't have questions. We don't have time for questions. I should proceed. Um, then what is nice from our model as well is that uh, we do actually do this thing of uh, doing the mass propagation for the one shot. Okay, so we use the, the mass from the first frame and we, we fit as well in the model. And we, we saw that it worked really well for one shot, but it didn't work very well for zero shot actually because the quality of the zero shot mask are, so we don't have any reference mask. and and we saw it's better not, not to propagate the mass than to propagate it because the quality is not good enough. So that's what kind of, you see that the semi supervised is when you provide the mass, the mass for the first frame and you see that the, the values are much higher than the, the one for unsupervised or, or zero shot. Um, okay, so here I put a law here. So in case you are thinking about if you like this topic and you want to do a master thesis on this, so we are looking for people who want to work on this. So if, I mean, we, we already have ideas about how to improve that, but if you want to improve it, just let us know. And also there's another task, which is instead of uh, generating, providing the first mask for the object you want to track, we are going, I mean, the task is given a, oops, given a language description of the object, uh, find the object and track it. Okay, so there's already one paper there. It's not a, something really crazy, but you can read it here, and we think that it can be better done. So if you like it, just let us know. There's a, also another task, which is called interactive task. So these are all uh, master thesis offers in which uh, the system is providing you a scribble. Okay, so you say, okay, that's, so you, there's a user that says, that's the object that I want. It doesn't, does a perfect segmentation, it just throws a fast scribble, okay? And then the goal is to segment the object, but on, on video, obviously. Uh, if you like it, today we release the source code, so you can play with it at home tonight. If you have, we are willing to play with it. And that's it for this topic. Um, do you have any question on video object segmentation? <coughs> 